Our second presentation will be provided by Professor Wong Hui from the Hong Kong University. His presentation will be sustainable lighting technology from devices to system. Let's welcome Professor Hui. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming to this section. And first of all, I would like to thank the RGC for supporting us for the last five years. Uh, we have a relatively small team with uh, two local universities, Hong Kong U and Polytechnic University, plus a uh, German university, uh, Kowloon University of Applied Science. Uh, as the title implied, it is an engineering project. Uh, we focus on sustainable lighting technology uh, with the emphasis from devices to systems. Uh, this is our team member. Uh, besides RGC, uh, we would like to uh, thank our two industrial advisors, uh, Mr. Mastroianis from Philips and Dr. Sun Tam from Optilab. Both of them have very strong industrial uh, lighting background and actually in the first few annual meetings, they gave us a, a many ideas of the grand challenges in lighting industry. So, and we responded successfully to, to these challenges and come up with some new breakthroughs which uh, we are going to uh, talk about. Now, in this presentation, uh, I will first use the first few minutes to give you an overall view of the entire project. And then I will invite my colleagues to give some highlights of different aspects of this project. We focus on the term sustainability. Many countries, many governments have uh, adopted the approach of Energy Star which only focuses on energy saving. But we have, been saving, we have been saying that energy saving itself is not necessarily environmentally friendly. Why? Because if you have an energy saving technology which has short lifetime and generate lots of electronic waste within a short time, they are not environmentally friendly. Okay, so we focus on three aspects. Sustainability here include energy saving, long product lifetime, in which we mean hopefully more than 10 years, and recyclability. That means we want at least a significant part of the product material to be recyclable, or the product will generate very little or no toxic components. Now, in, uh, in lighting system, we have three components, uh, the devices, uh, the drivers, and control, and we have to add them together to form a system. In early 2000s, the Chinese government uh, ordered all the local uh, city to use LED lighting in the streets. And by 2008, all lighting projects failed in China. So I was asked to help them to do the conclusion. At that time, there was already major breakthrough in LED devices, because by that time, the device lifetime would last from five to seven years. But they forgot that the driver the LED driver, which requ require a component called electrolytic capacitor, can only last for three years. So as a system, the electrolytic capacitor in the driver become the bottleneck of the entire system. Okay, so five years ago, we proposed this uh, project to handle the lifetime and reliability problem of the LED system as a whole. And in this project, we have both theoretical and practical aims in order to uh, optimize the LED system with long lifetime and reliability, we need a LED system theory that can unify the nonlinear interaction of heat, light, power, and color within one framework. And by that, at that time, there was no such theory. Okay? And we, we hope that with the development of this theory, we can combine the modeling of devices, drivers, into a system so that we can develop highly reliable LED systems. And I'm glad to report that uh, at the end of this five-year project, we have successfully developed the world's first photoelectrothermal theory, which can unify these four elements in LED light science under one mathematical framework. And we have also developed some new LED structures, which my colleague will talk about very soon. And very importantly, the Hong Kong U team and the Poly U team have jointly uh, conducted a comprehensive review of all the circuit topologies that are suitable for LED drivers. And we have published a 14-page paper last year in the IEEE transaction on Pyrotronics, which is 
the top journal in our field. And within one year, we have over 50 citations on that paper. So we have set a guideline for the lighting industry, how to choose the topology. And we have developed a series of LED drivers without the use of the electrolytic capacitor. And then my, my PolyU colleague will talk about uh, the, how they apply this te control technique to large LED display panel. And uh, we have also uh, several patents already transferred to industry, and some of them have been deployed for site tests for over three years. As a small team, we published uh, 30 journal papers, but we would like to focus that 24 of them are published in the same journal, which is ranked number one in lighting technology. And we have so far filed 11 patents. Three of them have been turned into products, and three others are being uh, under negotiation for technology transfer through Hong Kong U and Polytechnic Universities. This is a, a distribution of our publication in, for the devices, uh, drivers, and system theory. And for the driver, it is a joint collaboration between PolyU and Hong Kong U. The red colored research outputs are joint publications. So you can see it is a genuine collaborative research uh, under this pro uh, TLS project. And for the 11 patents, three patents colored in, uh, in red have been transferred to industry. Uh, and, and two of them have been turned uh, into product uh, used in uh, uh, street lighting in China. Now I will invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Anthony Choi, to give some highlights on the devices. Thank you, Professor Hood. Um, uh, I'm responsible for the uh, LED devices, which are based on the Ingengen uh, material system. And uh, in this project, we are focusing on uh, improving the sustainability of LEDs and also improving the uh, functionalities. So uh, focus is not so much on uh, efficiency. Uh, one of the issues with Ingengen LEDs in the moment is reliability, because efficiencies are pretty high. Uh, IQEs of as high as 80% for the blues are readily available from the best uh, structures. But then <clears throat> uh, the LEDs today, uh, the white LEDs today, are based on excitation of phosphorus using a blue LED at the core, which is pretty much like the last generation of lighting, the uh, fluorescent lamps. So in fact, you can actually call uh, today's LED lighting fluorescent lamps because they rely on fluorescence of phosphorus. So in the nitride community, there is a lot of interest in developing uh, phosphor-free LEDs because LEDs themselves can actually generate all the colors across visible spectrum by tuning the band gap of the material. Uh, there are other ways of doing so, including growing nanostructures, but our approach relies on nanostructuring of the most established platform uh, in Ingengen technology, which is the planar Ingengen multi-quantum wells. We make use of a structure that emits at longer emission wavelength, which is at present our choice is yellow, because that is as, as high as you can go in terms of emission wavelength, and making use of the strain relaxation phenomenon because when the wavelength goes longer, inherently due to quantum confined stark effect, the material becomes very strained. And when you actually try to release the strain, the band gap will become uh, narrowed down and therefore the emission wavelength will also become shorter. So by making use of this uh, idea, we came up with this, uh, uh, this structure that is uh, US patented, whereby we have a planar structure that n uh, naturally emits at uh, yellow wavelengths. And by incorporating a range of different uh, microstructures and nanostructures that you can readily pattern uh, using a range of techniques, including uh, electron beam lithography or other means, then you'll be able to have one single chip that emits across the entire visible 
spectrum, uh, which means that we can have white light emission without the use of phosphors. That is our approach towards phosphor-free white light LEDs. So this is the, um, uh, an SEM image showing uh, this sort of structure that has been realized showing uh, a mixture of very large, well, very large means of film micron uh, structures uh, next to very small structures down to tens of nanometers. And these are uh, diagrams showing emission from these uh, uh, LEDs. So you can actually see one LED emitting uh, colors all the way from uh, yellow down to uh, blue and uh, somewhere in between. These structures were done using nanosphere lithography and TUSTI, uh, a bit of uh, non-uniformity. But as you can see, the emission spectrum is broadband. Uh, you have got emission largely in the yellow band be uh, because the quantum waves emit in the yellow. And due to spectral blue shifting, we've got blue components. Note that the uh, blue component is weaker and in fact, that's what we don't like about LEDs today. There's a lot of blue light emission. People want to scale down blue light. This is naturally so. Um, and of course, that you saw that wasn't very uniform, not very controllable. Uh, so now we use, we, we use EBL, electron beam lithography, to pattern our structure. And we can have a, 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 an array of uh, dimensions uh, with, with structures of any dimension as you like it. So uh, this is very regular and high uh, pattern. This is the uh, emission from this particular structure. You can see that it's perfectly white light. In fact, the color rendering index in this case is over 60 using one single chip without the use of phosphors. And this is a spectrum. Now in this case, we intentionally added more blue light to show that we can do so although uh, people don't want that much blue light in their white light emission. And um, so this is a, a spectrum that is as broadband as you can using an in-gang GAN chip without using phosphors. And not forgetting the uh, issues of phosphors, uh, lifetime degradation and so on, because we want to make our LEDs sustainable. And phosphor would be one of the weakest link in current phosphor base white light LEDs. Now in terms of reliability, sustainability, the other aspect of LEDs we work on is to maintain the intensity because LEDs are very bright. They have very high IQEs and therefore LEDs naturally are made pretty small. If they are made large, I mean if each LED chip is large then uh, the, the amount of light emitted will be uh, exceedingly high, not to mention the reduced uh, efficacy. So we, uh, we, we'll have to put in a large number of LEDs in an area in a typical lamp. Now when you have tens or hundreds of LEDs in an area, one of the problem you're going to encounter is that over time, every LED is going to appear a little bit different. In terms of intensity, or in terms of color temperature, that's because each of these is an electronic device and an electronic device will degrade over time due to the PN junction. There's no way to correct that. Uh, you can only try to monitor the degradation and control it. But then uh, when you try to monitor light intensity, you have to use typically use uh, external detectors. Oh, that's a good example every time I take the uh, Airport Express, I'll notice that you see, all the LEDs actually have a bit of, of variations in uh, blue light intensity. That is what I'm talking about. So our approach is to integrate a photo detector on the blue LED wafer that detects blue light. Now, if you're going to uh, have a very ideal photo detector, you need to grow some other materials, but our approach is to actually use the material that emit blue light to detect blue light because these are complementary processes. So making use of the quantum wells to emit light, which has an emission spectrum here, which is corresponds to blue light, okay, and a corner, a portion of the device here to serve as, as a photo detector with absorption spectrum here and, and, and uh, represented by the black curve. 
This is called the Stokes shift, and the Stokes shift is due to excitonic binding energy. And, uh, but then, uh, despite the Stokes shift, the photodetector is able to cover half the spectral region of light emission, which means that it is capable of detecting light emitted by the same quantum well light emitter. So based on this, we have an on-chip photodetector that is able to detect the light and therefore monitor light in intensity vari variations. Uh, taking that photo current, we can therefore monitor, as shown on this graph, the variations in light intensity real time with high accuracy because of very good optical coupling. And that's not it, because we, if you know the light output, you can have a circuit to correct for fluctuations. And that is exactly what we did. And uh, we have a circuit that uh, takes into account the variations and will adjust the current real time in the, uh, integrated into our LD driver. And the result is that we are able to stabilize light output intensity over in this graph, 500 hours, but there's no limit to that, uh, throughout the lifetime. And therefore, if you have 100 or 1,000 of these LEDs in an array, the entire panel is going to remain uniform throughout its lifetime. And therefore, the lamp becomes a truly sustained, not just efficient, but also sustainable product that can be deployed in a large number of applications, not just for lighting, but for many scientific applications that do require intensity stabilized light sources. So uh, with that, um, I'll hand over to our next colleague who will talk about the drivers for the LEDs. So uh, thank you, Dr. Choi, and uh, thank you, Professor Hui. So, um, uh, the title of my presentation uh, is Precise Dimming and the Color Control of Bicolor White L uh, or RGB LED System. So the major challenge, one of the major challenge of the existing LED system is that they tend to produce uneven brightness or inconsistent color uh, over its operating lifetime. So, uh, so basically the LED uh, will, will degrade uh, over time uh, because uh, as, uh, the LED is a complex interaction of heat, power, light, and color. So uh, as you can see here, uh, let's say, uh, what, what, so why is the color consistency such a big deal? So just imagine if you are the retailer and when the customers walk into the shop, uh, you want them to notice and focus on your product instead of the color differences in the ceiling. And uh, if you are the property owner or the owner of a five-star luxury hotel, you probably, you, you probably want to maintain a color, uh, you, you probably want uh, that the property, you, you don't want them, you, you don't want the property to look uh, not, not well maintained because of the inconsistent, of the poor quality of the light. So the key is to maintain the color consistency. So uh, just like we human beings, LED will also age over time. So uh, as you can see, uh, the aging of the LED will manifest itself in terms of a lumen de depreciation and also a shift in the color temperature. So one of our research achievements is precise dimming and color control of bicolor adjustable white LED system. So the main objective is to achieve precise and fully independent dimming and color control, as shown in this figure. So uh, in an ideal LED system, when we want to uh, increase the lumen intensity from 100 to 550, we want the increase of the, uh, the brightness will not affect the color temperature. So the color temperature should stay constant, even though we increase the brightness. Likewise, okay, if we uh, change the color temperature from warm white to cool white, what we want is uh, the brightness should stay constant. So this is what the ID system wants to look like. So I don't want to bother with you with the technical details. Uh, so I just want to uh, briefly mention the 
for the conventional linear method is basically a, a linear, simplistic linear combination of the uh, CCD and the duty, whereas in our proposed method, we take into account the thermal interdependency uh, of the different color LEDs. So basically, uh, we did uh, uh, experiment ver verification to demonstrate the effectiveness of our proposed non-linear scheme. So as you, as you can see in the photo here, we have two bicolor white LED lamp. On the, on the left side, this lamp is controlled using the conventional method, which is used in the existing LED lamp. And on the right side, you see we have another lamp for comparison purpose, which is based on our proposed nonlinear method. And we have a table which contains the data. And uh, the data is plotted in the graphs here. So uh, the y axis is the color, and the x axis is the brightness, the luminous flux. So the red, the blue dot here is the target value, the target flux and target CCT, the correlated color temperature. And then as you can see, our measured data falls very close, almost on top, on the target value, which what that means is uh, our measured value is very close to the uh, target values. This is exactly what we want to see. So another major point I want to mention is uh, this, uh, our proposed control scheme is independent of the ambient temperature. So even if we go from very cold minus 10 degrees all the way to 55 degrees, we can maintain, we, uh, our proposed method can predict very well, okay. So basically it achieves very precise dimming and color control. So uh, the key message in this uh, slide is that uh, with our proposed scheme, no matter what the temperature, the ambient temperature is, we can maintain a uh, color consistency of uh, 3000 K. So our method is very robust uh, against ambient uh, variations. So uh, you may wonder what are the potential applications for our precise dimming and color control. So uh, for ex these are a few examples. For example, in the museum light ceiling and also in the five-star hotel, luxury hotel lobbies and uh, ballroom lighting, as well as studios. So um, another specific application for this precise dimming is surgical room lighting and photolithography room lighting as well. So, um, Besides by color LED, we also extend our technology to RGB LED systems. So uh, again, I don't want to bother you with so much technical details. So basically, uh, our proposed linear method uh, is a basically a, a polynomial function instead of a simplistic uh, linear averaging of the color sources. So we also did uh, extensive experimental verifications to demonstrate the effectiveness of our scheme. So as you can see, um, uh, in the, in the uh, color space here. On the right-hand side, you can see that the target point, the, color, the target coordinates and, uh, and our measured coordinates are in close proximity, proximity to each other, which means that the measured data and the target values agree very well with each other. So this is for RGB, okay? So uh, um, in conclusion, we also adopt, uh, we also set, uh, recently founded a uh, high-tech company uh, uh, based in Cyberport, and uh, we, some of these patents will be transferred to that company. And we hope that our technology will be able to put into practical use and also to the benefit of the societies in Hong Kong and uh, around the world. So thank you very much for my presentation. Thank you. So uh, I will continue the presentation uh, on the next topic uh, performed by the PolyU side. The uh, first uh, project is on a, a low-cost effective current balancing circuit for large LED panels. So basically, um, LED are small. To have uh, enough luminous output, we need to uh, connect them either in uh, series and if the serious connection of those LED are not enough, sufficient, then we may uh, make a parallel con connection of them. But then uh, we will end up uh, with a problem that uh, those LED may not give uh, equal brightness. For example, if the um, fluorescent lamp here or uh, D 
this role doesn't have a um, equal amount of movement that um, produce, then you will recognize very easily. So we need uh, something for the balancing. Uh, this can be active or passive. So let's uh, look at the industrial solution, which are actually quite small plus. And this is just an example. So LED uh, company uh, connected in parallel or in series. And you can easily use them for light out, such as a kitchen, and all those lights are um, very nice. If you uh, inspect carefully on this LED, you'll find that there is a resistor here, um, which will account for 60.5% uh, of the energy consumption. So actually, uh, you are thinking that you are using something very efficient in comparison to the fluorescent lamp. But however, uh, on the other hand, you are using some very um, power-hungry resistor in order that you can have um, even brightness. So uh, in this project, we are just trying to compete with this very cheap solution. Instead of using resistor, we may use something else, but come up with a solution that having cost um, that may uh, comparative to using resistor. But um, the capacity is not largely increased. Okay. So here are the passing circuitry. Of course, um, we may uh, let uh, other researchers trying to use an adapter for um, each LED. And our first solution is trying to replace um, the regulator by only a switch. So the resistor is being replaced by a, a little bit more expensive switch. By using this technique, uh, we, we will use a switching pattern such that this area and this area and that area are equal. So if the LED did have um, different property, by using this technique, it will be able to give us an equalized brightness for each string of the LED. So this is our first solution. So um, we use a low drop of um, regulator and try to use a switch here for the regulation of output bias, And of course, this solution, one switch in comparison to a resistor, the cost is still very high. So we are looking for uh, something else. And the previous solution have been published in a paper. So the next technique will be trying to replace resistor, for example, by transformer or inductor or capacitor, because uh, in terms of cost, they are roughly the same. Of course, uh, capacitor can be a, a bit uh, higher, but if uh, the batch is high and the number of is high, then uh, it doesn't matter a lot. But however, if we are using inductor or capacitor, the uh, adapter needs to be redesigned. It's because um, for the Capacitor or inductor, it will create reactive power. And we need to redesign uh, this adapter. And also, the driving should be in terms of AC. If you are using resistor, DC should be all right. So uh, in this project, we actually create a circuit which can be driven uh, by AC voltage. And by, the, by using this T circuit, we will find that the current and voltage can be aligned at some point. They are synchronized. And when they are synchronized, there won't be any loss um, from this converter. And the output current can be stabilized, which can drive a uh, LED load. So we have two solutions. One use inductor, the other use capacitor. So we find that um, using capacitor is better because it's comparably um, equalized in cost with a resistor. So this is our circuit. And I don't bother you with the capacity of the whole system. And of course, this can have um, some dimming if we wish to, but this is of a two-level dimming. OK, so 
we have present here a solution that competes with a uh, resistive method of current balancing by replacing those resistors with capacitors. So I do think this is already a uh, best scenario uh, in terms of capacity in, and cost for the balancing of current. So here, um, from the outside, we have a demonstration poster and also a video for demonstrating uh, this project. And you'll find that these are the capacitor we use. Okay. And in our poly side, there is another project which um, are trying to reduce the power that consumed on uh, the display. And for such kind of display, which are actually um, of the displays that being a video wall, that display with a light intensity in comparison to the sun. So those uh, display actually is very power hungry. So we are trying to build a control uh, technique which can substantially reduce the power consumption when the power output is very high and frightening the brightness of the sun. And of course, um, the impact um, will be very high because of the uh, energy consumption. And we observed that the LED will go into saturation if um, the temperature is high and the current is high. So normally, if we are trying to have a video display, every pixel of those displays should have a uh, dimming. And normally, uh, we will use a two-level dimming on and off. We have used it before uh, for the LED string. If we are observing this curve, we find that on and off here, this is on, this is off. And because um, this is not linear, and for the current here, we do not have a very high luminous output in comparison to a point here. Because at this point, we use less current, but with a more efficacy of the luminous output. And therefore, we use uh, the technique of two level. Instead of swing, switching all the way from zero to here, we switching in between uh, I1 and I2. So we have uh, this switching pattern in blue, switch to the green pattern. By doing this, uh, there is not much to change for existing control technology. Uh, we just use an uh, additional module for the other, another level. So we have um, successfully uh, built a, a prototype um, with a small number of pixels to demonstrate how much we have saved uh, from the energy bill. And those things are already patent and are ready to go to the market. And we already have um, some clients uh, internationally obtained the fund for this project. Okay, so this ends uh, of my uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, now I, I will go to the last section of, my, of our presentation on the system. Just now I mentioned that in LED life science, we have four elements, light uh, intensity, uh, heat, power, and color. Ten years ago, there was no system theory that can unify these four elements. And so we started uh, to unify three elements first, basically the light, uh, power, uh, light, heat, and heat and power, and we link, them, link them to, we link them up together to unify three elements initially. And after that, we link it to the color spectrum so that we can predict the color change. Okay? So, so this is how we form this unified theory for LED system. Now, one advantage of this system is that this theory allows us to model or to predict many variables which cannot be measured externally. For example, the junction temperature inside the chip cannot be measured externally. Okay? So, but we can give very precise prediction. And also, with existing uh, colorimetric uh, measurement, we cannot measure color change very quickly. Okay? But now we have this tool to predict color change very quickly. Now, let me just use this chart as an illustration how we can apply this system theory. Now, this chart 
the y axis is the light output, and the x axis is the power uh, injection of, of this system. Now, here show uh, the prediction and measurement of three curves. The first curve are the measurement come from uh, 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 US uh, lighting company, it's a prototype. When they give it to us, it's a three watt LED. So uh, after we do the analysis, we told them that if you reduce your power from three watt to two watt, you can double the light output. Because they didn't, under, they didn't know our system theory. So for three watt LED, they give it three watt, which is natural, okay? Now, we, then we, we redesigned the, uh, the heat sink for them. For the same power, we, we can generate three times the light output based on this new system theory. So this theory now become the, the world's first and at, the, at this stage, the only design tool uh, for optimization of LED systems. And you can also predict the transient. For example, if you have an LED system, like a traffic light, you turn it on for only a few seconds. So you can look at the light output at a very short time frame. But if you want, want to use it for a street lighting, you use it continuously, then you have to use, look at the steady state light output. Okay? So we provide this uh, function. And you can predict many internal uh, variables, like uh, the junction temperature, uh, et cetera. And we can predict the color shift. And we can even predict the color change in real time dynamically. Uh, the, the, uh, the sum of this uh, theory the, the, the has, been, has just been published by uh, Cambridge University Press uh, two months ago. Okay, so if you are interested in this theory, uh, it is now available. Uh, let me just finally uh, highlight one of our product. This is an LED system which has an efficiency of 92%, higher than any electronic version commercial product at the moment. And it has a lifetime exceeding 10 years, which is three to five times longer than the best of existing product. And 80% of the material can be recycled. So this is the only passive LED street lighting product that can meet the three sustainability criteria. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you, Professor He, Dr. Choi, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Wong. May I invite Professor Jen to come forward again to host the Q&A session for us? Thank you for all your presentation. And we don't have much time, so maybe you might the floor to have one to two quick questions to the team member then. Any question from the floor, please? Question to Dr. Choi. Uh, you got different colors of your pillars, right? Depending on uh, diameter. Yeah. Right, so what, 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 why is it like that? Is it quantum confinement effect? No. Is it strain? It's the quantum confined stroke effect. Oh, yeah. So the, uh, the band gap changes as due to the extent of strain in the quantum wells. So the, uh, the quantum wells are grown highly strained, mm -hmm. but by controlling the dimension, the strain state of each of those individual micro or nano structures will therefore have a different uh, effective band gap, therefore mm -hmm. emitting a different uh, wavelength or color, if mm -hmm. you like. But uh, Stark effect is related to charging in a way, or, is it, or do I understand it wrong? I understand it. Uh, quantum confinement Stark effect, uh, it is related to charging, right? You charge your system. Oh, no, 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 it's, it's no, not. no, no, not like that. No, no, no it's not. No, no. It's just strain, strain related, right? Yeah, it's strain. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor, please? I'm Keith from HKUST. So, in the introduction, Professor Hui. Uh, talk about uh, eliminating the electrolytic capacitor. So, but in the presentation here, it seems that uh, this is not mentioned. So, I, just, I would just like to see, uh, is there any, any, any slides or any, any uh, supplement on this, on this point? Uh, actually, we, the, the, our two teams has generated a series of uh, topologies without uh, the electrolytic capacitor, and that has been published in the 14-page uh, paper uh, just last year. So that's why we do not include all the details here. But now we have provide, provided uh, for the lighting industry a new family of circuits that they can choose for different applications. So that paper will become, we, we believe, will become the guideline for lighting industry, how to choose topology, uh, which control scheme for different applications. But because of the, it's a public uh, 
uh, symposium, so we, we, our target is the pub general public, so we do not give too much technical detail this time. Thank you. And the question for the floor? Yeah, please. Just a little bit of curiosity. Materials under strain are often not stable, and yours are. What, what is it that provides a calculus that makes, makes them stable while they're under strain? I don't quite get it. I mean, the, the strain of the quantum welds? Yeah. Well, the, all LEDs are strained. The in gang yeah. quantum welds are naturally strained because of lattice mismatch and thermal mismatch between gallium nitride and the sapphire substrate and the, uh, and the, uh, the uh, between the quantum well, well layers and the barrier layers. So any, any in-gen gen LED uh, would be strained. This is uh, a disadvantage or an advantage uh, if you can exploit this feature. It won't be unstable. It will, not, it will not affect the stability. It will reduce the internal quantum efficiency, though. Thank you. And now, do I have a last question from the floor, please? Yeah, just to follow up the previous questions. And since uh, your uh, quantum stack uh, efficiency, quantum stack effects cause a very low e uh, efficiency. Uh, I think it's a good idea to uh, make it uh, uh, shift the wavelength, but on the other side, the efficiency uh, may be uh, very low. <laughs> so, and do you worry about the efficiency uh, by using such method? to converting the wavelengths, yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's always it's a trade-off uh, in the sense that if you use blue LEDs and excitation pump, which do have higher IQEs, then you will have to uh, suffer from conversion and absorption losses of the phosphors and uh, also uh, degradation losses over time, lifetime issues, which would uh, become a limiting factor. So uh, the other aspect, of, uh, if we use an all Get a LED solution, then you don't have those, issue, those issues. Uh, we, the, the higher, longer wavelength LEDs do have lower IQEs, but then it's improving by the day because material scientists are working hard to solve the so-called green gap problem. So in fact, the uh, uh, moment if you use green LEDs, IQEs 40, 50% can be achieved. Um, so. Uh, in the future, I mean, pe people always are finding solutions to a phosphor-free uh, white light solution, and I believe this is one of the most promising solutions for that. Thank you all then. So, uh, because time is limited, so let's thank again the project team, Professor Hui, Dr. Choi, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Wong, please. So we now close the session and... Thank you all. The morning session of the symposium is coming to an end. Let's give a big round of applause again to thank our facilitator and presenters for their enlightening sharing. We will now have a lunch break until 2.30 p.m. Please come back on time and see you in the afternoon.